Mike, so, it's so great to have you on the podcast <laughs> and really excited. Uh, we're going to have a ton of fun. Good. There you go, brother. I'm excited too, Stefan. Thanks for having me. And you already turned me on to something I didn't know. So best podcast ever. I didn't know you could record in Skype. Awesome. <laughs> oh. All right. So I'm going through your audiobook, and I just love how you have these little sidebars and little anecdotes and stories that are not in the printed book. So what got you into doing that? Is that like a new thing, the trend that you uh, just came across, or is that something you invented on your own? Yeah, did not invent it on my own. It was reader feedback. So uh, my first book or two, I did not do sidebars. And then one of my readers said, you know, I love that I listened to just one author and they were doing sidebars. I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk who did it. Uh, I don't recall who they were referring to, but I think it was. And they said, oh, I wish you would do that. And I was like, wow, I'll do it. So the next one I did it, uh, my publisher, the mainstream publisher, they were hesitant. They're like, I don't know. Like, let me do it. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. And I, th I think it's because it's, it's bonus material. Um, but also I can write I can speak to why I wrote certain things and give a different perspective that you can't do in the written book. So I've done it in every book I've done since. And, and, and actually my publisher has asked me to go back to my old books and re-record them with the sidebars. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. And, and so, you know, the interesting thing that just, I'm just kind of on a roll here now, like clockwork, which is my most recent book after I wrote it, um, and, and submitted the manuscript, there's six months on average before the book actually goes to shelves. Well, during those six months, the research doesn't stop, you know, and, and there were some enlightening ideas. And I was like, oh my gosh, I discovered something new. And the recording of the book happens about a month before our live. So I got a five month window of additional research that I can pack into the audio that wouldn't be in the print book until the re-release version of the print book comes out. Oh, that's very smart. You know, that, I have that problem with my books, especially the big one. I have a, hey, this is my, this is, this is my big one. This is a thousand pages. Oh, wahaba da daba do. <laughs> the art of SEO. Uh, now I co-authored this thing. I, I don't think I could have done it by myself, but yeah. this goes out of date so quickly because yeah. it's SEO, it's Google algorithms and stuff. And to have an audio version, which we didn't do. I, I have an audio version of, this is my most recent, is uh, Google Power Search, how to yeah, find yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah, so, but that's that's an easy read. Somebody could take that on a flight with them. I think with the art of SEO, they'd get charged extra luggage fee for, <laughs> uh, you know, going overweight. So I want to have a, a capability of being more uh, up to the minute. Yeah. Because, yeah, six months go by, we submit it to the publisher, in my, my case, O'Reilly, and then the book finally comes out. And so much has happened in those six months. Yeah. And I think that's how authorship is morphing now. You know, so much changes so quickly that some books can have a perennial shelf life. They can just live on and on. But other books, by necessity, need to be speaking to the current arena around us, like your SEO book. Like you can't, it's hard to write perennial SEO because the algorithms are changing. But then we as authors need vehicles to deliver that content fresher and faster. And I think Audible is the next level, but I think it's beyond that is going to be, uh, I think these dynamic books, this is just my belief where the future is going, is where you have all these different sections and concepts, but you're able to go back and edit and update those sections. So the book today may have a section on, on in my book, on how to work with XYZ Bank. And then I may want to update that when new banking regulations come out. And uh, just that one section now is updated. And somehow I can push that either through some web you know, platform or something. But I think that's where we're going to these more dynamic living books than yeah. you know, printed once and, and sits on a shelf forever. Yeah, in fact, that that triggers this thought that uh, we're, we're going to have, I think, interactive books where it'll be an immersive experience. Yeah. And the the book that I think is most, uh, I don't know, effective at, at conveying this vision is called The Diamond Age, A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. Mm. I got uh, turned on to this book by Steve Jurvetson. Okay. Do you know who that is? He's no, like not. one of the top VCs in the world. Dra Draper Jurvetson Fisher. Okay. That's the VC firm that invested in, I think, Hotmail and maybe Google and stuff. Anyways, he's super crazy wealthy. And he said, this is his favorite book, huh? The Diamond Age, just about uh, like the coming era of molecular nanotechnology and what life's going to be like, but it's written as a novel. And it's... this young lady has 
this uh, this book that she carries with her, which is the this illustrated. Uh, it, it's it's an interactive primer. Yeah, and, and full fully immersive, like virtual reality and all this sort of stuff, and you get a sense for what's kind of come to pass. Like uh, movies will be an interactive. Uh, changeable experience, kind of like we're getting a sense with the Bandersnatch, uh, uh, the kind of interactive choose-your-own-adventure type yeah. of m- movie that was released on Netflix. So imagine that on steroids. Yeah. So this is a very exciting time where so much is going to change in such a quick time frame in no our life. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the concept of, immer- of immersion. You know, my son just got, I think it's called Oculus or something. He just one day, yeah. he, he bought it comes home and uh, I hear him hooting and hollering in his room. I go over there. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you got to try this thing on. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, you're in a uh, fantasy because there's a dinosaur coming at you and you're looking in the second layer, you're looking off this building, but it is, and this is, you know, this is gen one. It is immersive. It's like, wow. I mean, it feels real. And um, I think that's an opportunity in, in so many ways. I think this is my grand prediction. With therapists, I, there's a lot of people that, that have passed ones and we're never able to say their departing words. They haven't brought closure to that. Like through virtual reality, you can bring back and you can have a dialogue with someone that's deceased now and bring closure. I think the therapeutic impl- implementa- implications are significant and extraordinary. And that's just one little idea uh, of how our world's going to change. And I, I think as an author, I, I have a responsibility to leverage that, to be of service through that vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there are AIs that are being built right now where you just feed it all of the receipts of your loved one and uh, any kind of journal notes, all, all of that stuff. And the AI takes that information and builds an interactive personality. And so you can chat with your deceased loved one and get responses back as if it was the person. It's, it's wild. It's wild. It's pretty it, wild. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, let's go back to like the, the kind of day in, day out, got to make a profit. You got to keep cash flow uh, in in the bank so that you can pay your bills and that sort of stuff. That's, that's pretty immediate. And yet there's so many business owners, myself included, who are all focused on the revenue line and the profit was an after, uh, an after effect or, or kind of a, 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 a side benefit. Yeah. It happens at the end of the year or the end of the quarter. It's not something that's being engineered into the business. And I wish I would have read your <laughs> book or listened to it two decades ago when I started my entrepreneurial journey back in the mid 90s. Yeah. I had eight figures pass through my hands over that time period that I squandered because I was focused on growing the revenue line, growth, yeah. growth, growth. Yeah. which I achieved and I had an, a successful exit in 2010. Now I've got my, my, you know, I've got two businesses now that I'm uh, working on and I'm, I'm, I'm all in with yeah. profit first. Now I've got Thank the you. bank account set up uh, and, and I, I just want our listener to understand how important this concept is to their business to their like i think everybody's going to become a business owner in some fashion because they're yeah, going to become that's we're, freelancers that's what or whatever right i think so uh, it's funny our stories how parallel they are i, I started in the mid 90s to 93 i think or no i'm sorry 95 95 started my yeah, first me business. too 95 and um not an easy time to start business by the way no. and was in the technology space business was never profitable but i grew it to a couple million in revenue and i sold it to private equity and that's where i made money my second company was in computer crime investigation and it fast growth trajectory, 7 million run rate in two and a half years acquired by uh, Robert half international fortune 500. Here's the, 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 the thing I don't readily share, at least on my resume is those businesses were never, never fiscally healthy until I sold them. That's where I made my money that I was surviving check by check. And I, I started to believe this concept that profit comes last, that, you know, as long as you stick it out long enough, um, and you build your business fast enough that you'll make money at the end. So I decided to become an angel investor. My third venture was investing mm-hmm. in different startups. I had no right to be in that space. I was chock full of arrogance and ignorance and all those business collapsed. So I, 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 I got wiped out. Um, 
what I found is profitability is not an event. It's not an eventuality. And yet that's what we're told. You know, we're actually, our vernacular is profits the bottom line or it's the year end. All the terminology we use is it comes last. It comes last. What I realized is in our human programming, our behavioral wiring is when something comes last, that is the equivalent of saying it can wait or it's insignificant. Like if you, you would never say, I love my family so much, that's why I put them last. Or, <laughs> you know, or I just had a health scare, I'm going to start putting my health last. That yeah. all means insignificant. What we say is I'm going to put my family first. I'm going to put my health first. Prioritized stuff comes first. Insignificant comes last. So what I did in the Profit First book is I flipped the formula. What I say is it's not sales minus expenses equals profit. Profit comes last. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. And what I mean in practice is every time you have a transaction in your business, regardless of the size, we're going to take a predetermined percentage of that money, allocate it toward profit, literally transfer that money over to an account that we call profit, hide it from ourselves, and then the residual is what we have to rid our business off of. And what this is now is a simple process of reverse engineering profitability. You take your profit first, your business will tell you what's truly available to operate. It's now what's left over in your operating expenses. And you must adjust your business accordingly. Cut unnecessary expenses. Most businesses, 5%, 10% actually is pretty easy. And perhaps more significantly, increase margin. How do you dictate more for what you're doing? And by doing those two things, you are now serving the profit you're taking first. Yeah, that's an amazing concept. And it means that you show up at the buffet with a smaller plate, you eat less, and you, you, you trim the fat without it being as painful. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is how we're behaviorally wired is um, it almost, at first it's terrifying, right? When you start taking your profit first, because most businesses spend every penny they make. But the reason is because almost every business is run by a human, and we have this thing called Parkinson's Law. It's this behavioral mechanism that's in all of us. And basically what Parkinson's Law states is more – that there's as a resource increases in it, its availability, the more of a resource you have, the more will consume that resource. So the, the buffet line, the bigger the plate you have, the bigger you're serving because you have a bigger plate, but the greater the consumption because there's more food on your plate. If, if you go there with a little coffee saucer, I'll tell you, you're not going to eat as much because you can only put so much on the plate and then you eat the small portion. Well, Parkinson, he was a theorist in the 1950s, he studies this behavior of our consumption expanding to meet the supply and points out that it works with everything. Food, time was actually the majority of a study. The more time you're given to do something, the longer it takes to actually complete it. But it also applies to money. And in most businesses that I've worked with, small businesses, money comes into their bank. The entrepreneur looks at their bank account, see what their balance is, and based upon what they see there, makes decisions on how to spend money. Well, the more money that's coming in, the more they spend. And that's why most businesses, as the income is increasing, almost uncannily, the expenses are increasing at the exact same rate. So what we do is we take the profit first out, hide it away, and now you have you force a constriction on how big that plate is, how much money is available, and you work in with the confines of that. So the response is not like, it's not this miracle uh, uh, kind of system. It's simply just leveraging our behavioral mechanisms. If we supply less, we'll spend less. If we supply more, we'll spend more. And by taking our profit first, we force less supply. But the funny thing is, and the last point I wanted to make, is that we have over 150,000 businesses doing this now that we're aware of. We have 3,000 documented case studies. And what we found is none or very few of these businesses actually compromise the level of service they provide. The owner doesn't compromise their lifestyle. Um, the happiness quotient doesn't go away. It seems like the businesses go on unabated by taking their profit first. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I know that it's cost me millions and millions of dollars to not have this, this system or this this me mindset too. in place <laughs> over these last couple of decades. Yeah. And uh, you know what? The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time... I took immediate action. I got my bookkeeper to start implementing. We did the instant assessments and uh, I got the bank account set up. And you know, what's funny though, is she said, you're already really profitable, like crazy profitable, 69% profit margin. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So I went on this crazy, stupid spending spree at the end of last year. Because right. I wanted to reduce my taxes. This is how genius I was, right? Yeah. So I wanted to spend a 
a healthy six figure amount of money in a court in the course of a month. Yeah. To get my tax liability down. And yeah. uh, I regret that now. And I'm paying the, the, the piper, piper for that. For that yeah. For yeah, example, fine. I've got a, uh, uh, a contract in place where I prepaid for the year with uh, this vendor and they're doing a uh, m- mediocre at best job. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trapped. Yeah. Yeah. That's a classic. That's a classic thing. You know, what's interesting is, well, first of all, it points to you're very human. Um, we will, it's a human response to spend, you know, $10 to save three. And the reason is, so profit first is all based upon behavioral mechanisms. There's a thing called loss aversion. Loss aversion is once we possess something, you know, dollars come in our pocket, when it's taken away from us, it's more painful than we never had in the first place. So if, if there was, if I had $10 in my hand, say, Hey, I'm going to give this to someone else. And you just watch me give it to someone else. It's like, yeah, okay. If I said, Hey, Stefan, here's 10 bucks. Oh, give this $10 to that other person over there. It's like, Whoa, hold on. <laughs> That's my $10. You know, wh- clearly yeah. you, you gave it to me first. Once we have possession of something, we put more significance in it. So the problem with loss aversion is once we receive money and the tax man comes a knocking, now we feel that they're taking from us. How we address this in profit first, we have to defeat loss aversion. So we set up an account called the tax account. As money flows into the business, the business actually just hands it over to the government directly, basically. It just allocates the money and hides it away. Then when the tax bill comes, the money is pulled from that tax account and we don't feel that loss aversion. Actually, I get emails at the end of most quarters where people are like, I had such a great end of the quarter, I'm paying taxes, I feel so joyful about this because it's not coming out of my pocket. You know, and, and logically this is a shell game. We're just moving one a clump of money here, there, or there. But behaviorally, it works with our mechanisms and we don't make, you know, we don't make as many illogical moves. Um, like, like blowing money for me, it's a car, you know, oh, I'm gonna get that expensive car, I'll try to write it off, and I'm like, I can't use that car the way I want it to, it's a piece, I don't, I shouldn't have gotten it, and then there's regret and disappointment. Um, so it's, it's better to have the business pay our taxes and we start behaving more logically. Yeah, it, this reminds me of uh, the concept of paying yourself first and have it go immediately into a savings account, and yeah. I learned this one from David Bach, who wrote The Automatic Millionaire yes. and a bunch of other books. And yes. this is something I implemented four or five years ago. I set up uh, something called infinite banking using life insurance policies. I don't know if you're familiar with I'm this. Not. Yeah, this is something that the ultra rich uh, do apparently. And so I was in this Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership. So again, a very uh, expensive, uh, but actually very well worth it, uh, yeah. six figure <laughs> investment. But the the one of the benefits of that six figure investment, besides meeting my wife, which is oh, the very best go. investment in the world, is that I got this uh, insight in, into how the wealthy protect their money. And it, this particular model is that you use the life insurance policies, a certain kind of life insurance policy that is only a certain kind of life insurance company offers it. Like you have to go through a mutual insurance company because then the profits go to the uh, policyholders, not to the shareholders. So you don't want a shareholder owned life insurance com- company. Oh. So anyways, uh, you, you have to get the right policy, right kind of company, et cetera. And you use the cash value. You use that as a money machine. You keep plowing money into it. And that was the way that I paid myself first. And I've been uh, yeah. I've set up like four policies uh, for me so far, and I can keep adding more policies. Um, my my wife is is insured as well, so we we, we use this as a way to um, not just hold money, but we take loans out to uh, or loan money out to others instead of using the bank. Oh yeah, you become your own bank. You become yeah. your own bank. Yeah. And pay yourself. The, yeah. the, the best thing about this is the money that's in the policy, even when you take interest on the loan, but the entire fund, everything that is in the cash value is still accruing a guaranteed minimum 4% interest, even if you've loaned out 50, 80, 90% oh, wow. of it. It's really, really slick. So this is something that... Uh, uh, I, I've gotten in, into and been using for the last four or five years, but it's only personally paying myself first. I never did that with the business with profit first. Yeah. So I, I, 
this concept of pay yourself first has been around for eons like you know it's documented in books like the richest man in babylon talks about pay yourself first the uh think and grow rich talks about so this pay yourself first concept has been around forever it's a proven strategy and it again it works with our behavior if we remove money for our future first we will adjust our lifestyle to live off the remainder that's basically what it points out to and the thing is since it works for ourselves uh, in our personal lives, of course it works in our business because we are the same self who's running the business. There is no difference. And there's a saying in entrepreneurship that our business is really a parent-child relationship. You know, I start the business, I give life to this business, I, I nurture it and care for it and grow it. I'm its parent, it's my child. One day it will have its own legs, it will support itself, it will return and support me. And I call BS on that. I think it's a horrible analogy. I mm -hmm. think the real analogy is conjoined twins. And, you know, the business and us have lives that live and are interlocked together. We share critical organs um, and everything. And the, the separation, therefore, is a very surgical separation. But the point also is when you're conjoined, as one, uh, one part of the entity's health goes one way, so does the other entity. So if you're struggling financially at home uh, and your business is crushing it, your business is going to take on that debt and responsibility or vice versa. You can be crushing it at home, but the business is struggling. You're going to start struggling at home. So we need to bring health to both equally um, uh, of equal importance. And the methodology is, is the same. It's the pay yourself first principle, just applied yeah. to business. Yeah. 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 Very cool. And, and uh, talking about behavior and kind of how uh, loss aversion works and all that. I've, I've been talking with uh, BJ Fogg, you know, BJ, no, I maybe that name sounds familiar. I don't know. Uh, he's pretty famous. He's like okay. the guy uh, around behavior change, oh. and um, uh, so I don't. You probably heard of the book Atomic Habits. Yes, by James Clear. James Clear. So, I know James. Yeah. Okay, so BJ is the guy that James based a lot of the book oh, on. Oh, okay. So Atomic Habits are essentially tiny habits. Right. And you ride on the coattails of existing habits to create new habits. That's all BJ's research. Yeah. So BJ, uh, he invented this terminology to refer to an emotion that ne so uh, at, as of this point uh, prior to BJ hasn't been named. He calls it shine. And basically the idea here is you get this emotion when you have success. Mm. So let's say that you have, uh, I don't know, done inter intermittent fasting for seven days now in a row. Like, yes, <laughs> I'm like on a roll, but then you miss a day. Right. Like that shine goes away. And if you don't, if you build an app, for example, or you have a methodology that doesn't keep feeding the shine. So you keep getting that sense of success, that feeling of mastery and control of your own destiny and all that sort of stuff then you're going to fall off the wagon. So like mm -hmm. with the Way of Life app, which is an app I love, it's a brilliant idea. You get to uh, check the, the box and show the box for every day that you keep that chain going of that new positive habit or the thing that you're trying to break. And you're like, okay, I, I didn't smoke again for another day. And you don't want to break that chain. Like uh, Seinfeld talked about, he would right. put a, an X in every day in the calendar that he wrote a new joke, and he would want to keep the chain going, otherwise he'd start all over again, and that is, feels pretty painful. But if you focus on, in your app development, let's say your way of life, and, and, and you focus on the shine, then it's not just keeping the chain going, but how do I get somebody back on the wagon because then they feel defeated. They right. feel like a loser, like, oh, right. no, I got to start all over again. I got a red box instead of a green one. And I fell off the wagon. I never got back on in terms of using that app. It's been over a year. I loved that app while I was successful with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. So um, I have, I'm, I'm wearing right now the uh, iWatch or whatever. I think this is version one. It's, it's one of the originals or maybe it's two. I don't know. But it has the Apple that. Watch, right? Yeah, it yeah, has. Watch, I yeah. use the fit. I use the fitness app on it, and um, it builds this chain, right? So every time I work out, but here's what it does: what it built into it is if I miss, it says, "Hey, it's okay. You've got this. Let's get back to it." And uh, it starts kind of almost making a reverse chain in that if I miss two or three consecutively, it starts kind of coming more alert and say, "Hey, what's going on?" and um, and it motivates me to get back to it. 
I don't know if that's the perfect solution, but I have found I work out much more religiously ever since I've implemented this watch than any time before. Um, and, you know, I guess also there's a certain point I found with a habit, this is true with profit, that once you go do it long enough, it, it defines you. And it's okay to kind of slip up. Mm. That it's like, oh, that was just a bad day, or I just missed it, or whatever. But it doesn't become the new habit of saying, I don't have this and I give up. And I don't know how long it takes to get there. But I do know it takes time to get there. And what we've done with Profit First is when people implement the system, the people who fail, we have over 150,000 companies doing this now. When the people fail, it's because they went full out, full bore from day one. They said, you know what? I haven't been profitable. I want to do, you know, your numbers like 60 plus percent or whatever, 20% profit. Let's do this. And they're all hyped up for a day. And then when the bills come and they can't pay their bills, they're like, this doesn't work for me. I'm a failure. And they go all the way. The pendulum goes all the way the other direction. The people who have been successful say, and we teach this in the book, start with 1%. Just allocate 1% of your income to profit because that's such a negligible amount that it's almost impossible to break that chain. Like if $1,000 comes in, I'm saying take 10 bucks, put in a profit account because 1,000 bucks versus 990 bucks, that isn't going to have an impact on how you run your business. But the, the, the 10 bucks in the profit account that will have an impact on your perception that you can allocate to a profit and do that for three months, just 10%, I mean, 1%, 1%. And then after three months, then we go to one and a half or maybe 2%. And after another three few months, we go to three or 4%. And now we're, we're in this habit and it gets stronger and stronger. And now, you know, it may take a year or two, but now we're doing like 10 or 15% and, and, and the habits established. And if we slip for a little bit, we get right back into it. So it, it's these small micro steps, maybe it's atomic habits to some degree, it's these small micro steps of progress, I think making us become a new believer and wire our brain in a new way that even if we slip up, our standard is this new way and we're going to stick with it. Yeah, that's, that's uh, very insightful. And I think it, it might even be part, become part of our identity. That's, that, oh, I'm a profit exactly. first entrepreneur, right? This is how I am in the world. And yeah. It's like the difference between somebody who says, well, I've stopped smoking and somebody who says I'm a non-smoker. Hey, oh, huge. I, I am such a believer in labels. Uh, you know, I'm talking to entrepreneurs regularly, and I think the word entrepreneur has been bastardized. I think entrepreneur has been interpreted to hustle and grind, and I don't like those terms. You know, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think our goal is to find out how to work more. I actually think the goal of an entrepreneur is how do I work less? How do I get more done by doing less? Like that's really the definition. So this hustle and grind, I do understand the sentiment, but I think it's a really, it's the, the way it's being um, absorbed is, is horrible. And yeah. so it's, it's incentivizing the wrong behaviors. It, it totally is. It totally is. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning you do have to make some sacrifices and you will have to put yourself out there in a way you haven't before. But if you're going to carry a business on your back, that's no way to carry a business. Your back will break. So, I think the word entrepreneur has been bastardized. And even though I love entrepreneurship and I will do anything for it and I love the word, I don't like its bastardization. So I tell people, uh, of course, I'm a shareholder, which is kind of like a, a deer in the headlights. When you're at the next time you're at a dinner party and someone says, what do you do? Oh, I'm a shareholder in my business or a shareholder in a business. It's like, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, it sure as hell means you don't work there. Like I'm a shareholder in Ford. I don't, you know, Ford sends its distribution. I'm like, I don't hop in the car and say, yeah, shoot down to Ford and work the line for a little bit. I've taken, I've invested in their stock. I've taken risk. I'm hoping the valuation goes up or it seems like recently it's been declining a lot, but I hope it goes up. We are shareholders in our own business. And yes, the business needs people. And maybe the only person we can hire temporarily is ourselves, but you're a shareholder and we better start acting like that. And a shareholder does not work the line, does not work in the business. They render votes. They influence who's running the place. And you may insert yourself for a period of time, but shareholder, as a shareholder, you got to extract yourself out from the doing as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. So there's another expression that's going to work on the business, not in it. Exactly. That's Michael Gerber's, you know, he, he popularized that. And that's exactly yeah. what it is. But, you know, the ch I went out with Michael, uh, this is a few years ago. We were keynoting together in Mexico, of all places, Monterey, Mexico. And we go out for dinner, and I'm sitting with him, and I talk about the challenge of this in versus on, and what I propose. What I believe, I love his book, and it's a must-read, The E-Myth. What I believe is is being perceived that this is a switch, that one day, if I work in my business hard enough, that one day I'll be permitted to work on my business. Like one day this switch will just flip, and now you're on your business. And the reality is the more you work in your business, the more you become entrenched in the business, the more dependent it comes. 
So it is a surgical extraction, back to that conjoined twins. We need to, starting today, be very deliberate in removing ourselves, but it's not gonna happen in a second. This re extraction process is over time. And what I studied, and I wrote about it in my book, Clockwork, was that an entrepreneur needs to r physically remove themselves from their business, in many cases, to discover where the business is dependent upon them. Because when you come back, that stuff won't get done. And those are the things you need to systematize. And then you gotta extract yourself again and see is it really working now without you? And whenever it's not working, you gotta come back, fix that, systematize it, and remove yourself again. And it's this process of actually physically and digitally disconnecting from the office for longer and longer periods that gives this business the direction it needs to run itself. Right, and then it has staying power and it's it's not self-employment, it's actually a business because a business isn't a business if it doesn't have an exit strategy if you can't end up selling it when you want to. Yeah, and, and you know, people are like, you know what, I'll, I'll work until I can't work anymore. And sadly, that's th the case for many people, but it doesn't usually end on their terms. It's they're too tired, they're sick, or there's something wrong, and now the business has no value whatsoever, it's done. The ultimate business is a business that has no dependency on the owner itself. Like, I go to McDonald's, admittedly, pretty regularly when I'm traveling, <laughs> And I'll stop by at McDonald's, and I've been asking this, Stefan, it's my favorite question, and I encourage anyone listening in to do this. Go to any McDonald's, go to the cashier, and say, hey, do you mind if I speak with the owner real quick? I'd like you to just to, to thank him or say hi or whatever. The owner is never out of McDonald's. I've yet to been to McDonald's. I'm like, is, is it the person in the little closet there that they call an office? No, that's the store manager. Is, is the person flipping the burgers or cooking the fries? No, those are workers. I'm like, where's the man? Where's the owner? Oh, they own multiple McDonald's. You know, they come in here and pick up the money every so often. That's what the owner does. Picks yeah. up the money. You know, McDonald's is a great example on building a structure where there's no dependency on the owner. And I think that's what we need to aspire to do. You want people come into my office going, hey, is the owner here? And they're like, oh, no, he hasn't been here in a few months. Like, that's a business that runs on itself. I believe in it so much now that um, I take – and I wrote about this also in my book, but I, I take a four-week vacation. I've done two so far. I have a third one coming up uh, in just a few months. Four weeks, I'm just away from my office. I, I don't, I'm not in contact. They changed my email. I have no access to anything. I believe in it so much now that I have my employees now going through four-week vacations. Kelsey, my the number two here at the office, went on an eight-week vacation. And the goal is I don't want to have any linchpin dependency. Because, you know, Kelsey even one day may show up and say, um, I just don't want to work here anymore. And I am screwed. So Kelsey, by scheduling an eight-week vacation, we had to find out how to get all the work off her plate, systematize it so other people could do it. So we captured all her knowledge, all these videos, all these different things, outsourced it to the rest of the team, and the rest of the team did it. Kelsey comes back, and now there's redundancy. Kelsey can do it, or others can do it. And now those others are going on vacation. So it's bringing about this redundancy, so there's no dependency on one single linchpin anywhere in the organization, including me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now, one thing I learned from uh, Ari Mizell, who was on the show, is that if you just have the videos of the trainings, that only takes you so far. If instead you have somebody go through those videos and create checklists based on the videos, and then a different person actually takes those checklists and tries to implement them and then doesn't uh, have success because there are some missing pieces, there are some gaps. If you have the same person who shot the videos do all three yeah. steps, then the stuff's not going to get exposed where there are gaps. Right. That was genius. Yeah, so I have a, a different flavor of that, but this I think it's similar to the same end result. What we'll do is we'll film a video recording the process, right? We'll give it to the person that now has to be responsible for this process. They will be given that process for a period of time so they can figure it out. And then they're required to make another video of them recording the process. And the reason is the smartest student in the room is always the teacher. And we know when a, another employee can teach the process, they've mastered the process. So it's another kind of flavor of that. Maybe it's a combination punch. Get the, you know, the checklist created with the person doing the work also being able to teach it. Maybe it's the combination one-two punch. I love that. And that uh, reminds me of a statistic I heard not long ago that your average retention rates, if you're paying attention and you really care about the topic, uh, let's say you're in a seminar or something, is about 30 percent, 30 something percent. But it goes up to uh, as much as 90 percent if you have the intention of teaching that subject and what you're learning to others. Oh, I never heard that. That's awesome. 
Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Okay, so I want to, uh, oh, and another thing I want to uh, mention uh, uh, that I learned from Michael Gerber, and he was also a guest on the show, uh, so listeners definitely check that uh, episode out. So Michael explains in the E-Myth that there's a, a, a separate company that you set up called Nuco. You don't try and retrofit all the, re- retrofit all the new systems and everything mm. into the existing business. That's just a recipe for disaster in his view. So you start building these new systems into a new entity that you call Nuco or whatever your yeah. name is for this new business. And that from the ground up has all those great new systems in place. What's your thought on that? Is that something you also uh, subscribe to or you do you go in and fix the existing business? Uh, well, I love that idea. It's the first time I heard of it. Um, I think it's my instinctual response is that's an amazing idea because when it comes to uh, building something new in an existing business, you also have to dismantle the other thing. And there's this political and social momentum that many people don't account for. It's funny, yeah. like you, I walk into a business and they'll say, that's the president. I'll say, okay, but that's not the person running the company. It's her, the receptionist. Because you can see the social web that's going on and the control that person has. So when it comes to improving a business, I've actually have not done that process that Michael Gerber purports. I've tried to build new and uh, remove the old scaffolding, but that's required terminating employees in, in certain circumstances and, and taking away habits and you know, that you ask someone, why do you do it that way? And they're like, that's the way we've always done it. I think like unwind that embedded culture. Um, so I do like this idea of Nuco. I wonder just kind of thinking out loud here. So I wonder if that forces though, the same kind of requirements of, of new people, new belief systems. I wonder if people take a leap from old co to new co, if, if they can wash their mind of the old ways, you know, it's, it's the human element. That's the challenge because you know, the, we aren't working with robots and computers exclusively, maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day. Yeah. Maybe one day, yeah. For our early conversation, maybe someday sooner than we expect, but you know, we are working with humans here and, and, and then we have habits and processes and experiences and political agendas and biases and, those elements are the ones that are tricky to navigate. I've inevitably found that when trying to establish something new is I need the people uh, that are going to be doing the new process to be the ones who invented it, to be discoverers of it, because that's the way they believe in it. So it's a very collaborative effort. Instead of saying, here's the new way we're going to do things, it's like, let's discuss a new way to do things that's better. And if I can get them to own the process of developing it, they believe in it and are much more likely to be successful. So, yeah, you get them to be uh, the, not uh, just the owner of the idea, but the inventor of it. If it's yes. their idea that you kind of spoon fed them, but they didn't realize it, like then they're going to be more invested in it. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Because yeah, yeah. listen, I'm, I'm just as human as all of us. And, I, you know, I, I found this fascinating study. There was a, uh, and I don't know the source, so this may be a little bit hearsay. There was a study of husbands and wives, and they asked husbands first. They said, when you have an argument with your wife, how often are you correct? You Have you determined? And the husband said, about 80% of the time. They then <laughs> went to women. They went to women. And they said, how often are you correct uh, when you really evaluate it? And the women said, about 80% of the time. Well, that, that the, you know, the most you have is 50-50. Like, that, that doesn't compute. And 80-80 is a 160. It does not work. Yet it's human bias that once we render an opinion to cling on to it, even when we actually know it's wrong, and this is true not just in spousal relationships, it's true in business, that once we become a, a generator of an idea, we cling on to it. And if we don't, uh, if someone else thrusts an idea upon us, it's natural, resi- it's natural for us to resist. So that's why I think it's so important for people to own ideas so they can cling on to it, but to your point, to navigate them to the right idea uh, so they cling on to good ideas. Yeah, yeah. I think that isn't that referred to as like confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that yeah. means we only seek out what approves what we've decided upon already. Yeah. Or support. So, anyways, this uh, totally goes against my uh, primary adage in life, which is "happy wife, happy life." <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's, just a, that's not. That's more an adage. That's a plain old fact. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, another thing I wanted to talk about in regards to human nature and and behavior is there are certain uh, resistances that 
folks will have to your your methodology, your framework. For example, I have a good friend, uh, Greg, uh, who runs a very successful design business, and he's he loved your book. Uh, he's actually going through Clockwork now and loves that one too. But he he went through Profit First, and his resistance is. Uh, in in creating the bank accounts, yeah, he he doesn't want to do it. He just has yeah. spreadsheet, and um, he's like, well, why do I need to set up the separate bank accounts? It just seems like extra unnecessary sure. administrivia, and and so he hasn't done it, but he's applying some of the processes that he's learned about from your book. And so my question for you is, what what do you tell him uh, that the cost is? for not doing this 100%, not setting up the separate bank accounts and having a another bank, a second bank that holds the tax account and the profit account that you don't have an ATM card to, that you're not constantly checking the bank account balances to. Like what's, what is he missing? Yeah, and it, often when I hear people uh, skip that step, it's a short, they're avoiding short-term pain and ignoring the long-term gain. Let me explain the reason why it sh should be at the bank accounts. It must be at the bank accounts. Is that I've surveyed now easily hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs. I, I speak regularly. I, at every conference I speak about Profit First, I've been speaking for for years and years now. I'll do a survey saying, show, raise your hands if you do what's called bank balance accounting, which I mean you log into your bank account with some frequency to see how much money you have so you can make financial decisions. And I would say 95% of the hands go up. Probably more, um, but some people do the old alligator claw and are a little bit embarrassed. But, <laughs> you know, the, the hands go up. And I, I, and I tell people, I want to affirm that that's natural, typical, normal behavior for a small business owner. We don't read the accounting statements. We don't read the income or balance sheet. Actually, some people don't know how to read balance sheets or cash flow statements. I'm one of the people. I don't know how to read a cash flow statement. And I even question if my accountant really gets it at times, to be honest. And what we're told in traditional accounting is, Read the accounting statements, read the balance sheet, read all the different things. Don't look at your bank account because that's not reflective of your business. Operate off these different accounting uh, documents and you'll run your business just fine. But our natural behavioral path is log into your bank account because it's the easiest path to follow. It takes a few seconds to log in, you see how much money you have, and you can make decisions. It's human nature to revert to the easiest path. Therefore, we have to set up the accounts there to intercept our natural path. If you do this on spreadsheets like, like Craig is doing, the question is, does he log into spreadsheets all the time, anytime he needs to consider money? Is that what he always does? He always goes to the spreadsheets first, honestly? And I suspect, if he's like most people, no. Most people don't go to their accounting system first. And the accounting system, by the way, is a spreadsheet. It's just a one with a special interface on the front. But it's a simple, simply a spreadsheet. You, you actually... Off your current accounting system, you can go to this thing called the chart of accounts. It has all your money broken out a million different ways already. So you already have the system in place. The question is, how is it serving you? And most people I ask that say, well, it's not serving me because I don't use my accounting system that way. So I understand that it feels like, oh, it's a pain in the ass to go to the bank for a few hours and set up these accounts. It's literally a few hours to set up a few accounts. But now, since the money's getting divided up at your bank, there is no avoiding anymore. When you log in, you know exactly what's available for what purpose before you spend it. And that's the key for profit first, doing it at the banks. Right. And you're not checking, you're obscuring your ability to see what's in your profit account and your tax account by having it at a separate bank that doesn't have online banking, that doesn't have an ATM card, because that money is not supposed to be considered. And if it's part of the spreadsheet, you right. totally defeated the whole right out of, of sight. I mind. it's funny. So I was talking with a uh, developer uh, about this concept of profit first. Like, oh, we can make an app and we'll show right in the profit people are making because that's what they're looking to do. I'm like, nope, it's the worst thing to do because they'll say, oh, I have this money saved up, I can spend it. We need to hide it from ourselves, out of sight, out of mind. And when that happens, when stuff is inconvenient, it's human nature goes to the convenient path, we, are, we look within our operating expenses and work within the confines of what's available. So yes, we get it out of sight so we don't see it, don't have access to it, make it inconvenient, and you, you run your business properly because you're kind of forced to. Yeah, yeah. There's another behavior that happens where you have a really good month and you extrapolate that outwards for yeah. the next X number of months or years and you think, okay, 
I've got a new business that is at this level and oh. that's a big mistake, right? <laughs> I got an email from this guy years ago, and my response was a little bit jerky, but um, I had to do it. So this guy, he sold a product online and had his first uh, month, he did 100000 Every month before this, he did about $20,000 or so, you know, a $250,000 business. One month, he has $100,000 because a major um, media channel uh, wanted to buy his product for this, this big event they were doing. We brought in $80,000 of revenue that month. And he emails me and says, now I know what it's like to run a million dollar business. And so I wrote a little bit of an anxious response back to him. I said, how did you do the, the 100,000? how did you get the help? Because you had to do, you know, four times the volume. He's like, well, my uncle volunteered to help out and family came in. My kids were working like crazy and all this stuff. And we got the job done. And I said, that's not a million dollar business. That's a panicked way to do $100,000 in one month. A million dollar business has the systems to support that. So I said, I, I hate to break the news to you, but you have no clue what it's like to run a million dollar business. You know how to panic respond to a big order. And that's great, but we need to the sophistication. And that's, a, I was picking on that guy, but that's the natural nature of all of us. We have a good month and we expect that to be the new standard. Um, and then we start the spend in our head accordingly. Well, hey, we just did 100,000 this month. Now I can get that, you know, that hire those employees and so forth. We know logically it's the average. And that's what Profit First does. As money comes in, it starts allocating money out to different percentages. It secures the money away for your profit account. That profit doesn't come to you. It sits on the sideline as the other months roll by, and your business will adjust accordingly and be, be much healthier because you're not seeing these instant highs and taking all the money out for yourself instantly and also ratcheting up your lifestyle accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, so you recommend that you take the – worst three months of the last 12 and average that out and use that as your baseline to assume that, you know, that's going to come back. You're not going to always be at this new high. You could very much uh, just as likely be the next month at that average of the low three months rather than, you know, continue to keep that trend line going. Right. We do that calculation because uh, when it comes to calculating, we call it an instant assessment where we want your, your, income to be for your personal income as a business owner, uh, where your profitability will be is it is very difficult because of loss aversion is very difficult for us to ratchet back our lifestyle. So it's very easy to ratchet up a lifestyle, but to unwind is very quick. So once you buy that house and you have that mortgage going to get out of it, I'm not saying legally to get out of it and you know sell it, um, to get out of it emotionally is very hard when, you know, there's people they'll buy that, Oh, that shiny red sports car. They've always wanted, they see it in the shop window uh, at the at the auto shop and they don't buy it uh they don't worry much about it but when they buy it now it's their baby and they put it in the garage and, and the day they can't pay it and the pink slips are being called they're going to repossess your car people will drop the insurance in the car never drive it because it's not insured now but at least we're saving i'll work a second job just to pay the payments on this car we'll do all these extraordinary things to retain something when we possess it but we wouldn't do those extraordinary things like working a second job to acquire so the lesson here is as our lifestyle ratchets up, that um, very quickly it becomes our new norm and it's very hard for us to unwind. So if we set our lifestyle and our business expectations and all stuff off our highest income, I know it's going to drop again. We're in real trouble because it's going to be hard to unwind that. If we set on our lowest expectations, well, statistically likely things are going to get better on average and we won't go through that loss aversion to that same degree or not at all. Right, right. And you, you put a lot of emphasis on celebrating when you have uh, a successful high, yeah. you know, you, you've met, you met your, your, uh, your, your targets. Yeah. You have this thing called TAPS for target allocated Allocation percentage. percentage. Yeah. yeah. So like, what's, what's the key thing about celebrating that it's kind of, I guess and, it's that and I know the factor. answer to it, but I, yeah. I want our, our listener to understand how important it is. It made me go back to that shine factor you were talking about earlier. So what we do is we get into a rhythm with profitability of doing quarterly profit distributions, which sadly for most small businesses doesn't exist. It's usually year end. It's even considered and it's not there anyway. And then there's, there's like this, Oh, shucks moment. Maybe a year from now I'll finally be profitable. But I insist with profit first every quarter, every 90 days, for profit to come out because it builds up anticipation, the profit comes out, and then we celebrate with it. Now, here's here's the rules of profit. Uh, is never to be plowed back or reinvested in the business because that's never a profit. 
profit can't be plowed back or reinvested. Expenses can be spent. Profit can be distributed to shareholders. So I was at this event and I speak and this woman comes up and said, you know, we had a 28% profit last year. So I don't think I need your system. I said, I don't think you do either. That's amazing. Congratulations. I said, what'd you do with all that profit? She's like, we reinvested it. I said, what do you mean? She goes, <laughs> she goes, every penny went back in the business. I said, well, then what happened? She goes, well, we spent it. We, we bought new equipment and spent on stuff. I said, oh, okay. So it was an expense. She goes, exactly. I'm like, that's not a profit. That's an expense. I think you need the system now desperately. So, <laughs> you know, great. if you spend money, it's an expense. If the money's distributed to the shareholders for their use, it's a profit. And it is that black and white. Yet we, you know, we, we put confusion in there with this, with this reinvestment or, or plowback term. So that's rule one. Rule two is, um, if you do have debt, I am a major fan of eradicating and eliminating debt, uh, building our own cash equity in our business, becoming our own banker, to your point with that example earlier with life insurance. So if we have debt, we still allocate money to our profit. But when a profit distribution comes out, a vast majority of that profit will be used to eradicate and alleviate all of our debts. Over time, you may have to do this multiple times. But a portion still comes out to celebrate to the owner, for the shareholder to use any way they want. And the idea is the endorphin release. If we receive a profit and can spend it, we feel good. It builds our muscle around profitability. We want to experience that again. If our profits never come out to us, it actually causes the reverse. We start to uh, become resentful of our business. Gosh, another quarter with no profit. This is just, my business is sucking my soul away. So even if we have debt that we're eradicating using the profit account, which is the one exception to just using it to celebrate, we still celebrate with a portion. Once the profit is, uh, is fully available for us and coming out to us, it's always used to celebrate. And celebration does not mean, go, you know, go have a crazy party. But if you do, please invite me. What, what it is, is, you know, maybe saving for your future. Maybe it's putting into those, uh, that cool infinity loop you set with your bank. Maybe it's putting money for your, your kid's education. Or maybe it is going out for an amazing dinner and a great vacation and saving for education. But it all has to go to reward you. It has to give you that endorphin release. And I know paying bills in your business with profit is not an endorphin release. Not right. typically. Yeah, and so when you're paying down your debt and most of it uh, goes down uh, to the, the debt repayment and then a little bit goes for celebration, you have a strategy where you say take the biggest uh, nut to crack, like the biggest debt and pay that off first and pay the minimums on the rest of them until then you get that first one paid off and then you go to the next one, you pay that one off fully rather than try and allocate tiny little slivers uh, towards every single one of your debts. Yeah, so the answer is kinda. So it's actually pay your smallest debt first, not your oh, okay. biggest. Okay. Yeah, and this is not my strategy. Uh, this is, I read about it through Dave Ramsey. It's, a, it's been a strategy been around before. He calls it the debt snowball. And so what Dave Ramsey purports is that if we pay our smallest debts first, and while we maintain the minimums, we will have the earliest win. So it's not based upon interest rates, it's about amount due. So if I have a small debt that I'm focusing on first, I'll pay it off way faster than I would a big debt. Which when you tear up that statement, and I've done this, I had a lot of debt, I went through this process, it feels amazing. But now the minimum payment you were making toward that small debt plus the extra payments, now gets added on that, a minimum payment toward the next debt. So now you have two minimum payments going toward the next smallest debt. So you start getting a little bit of momentum there and you start focusing on that. When that one's eradicated, and again, it's one of the smaller debts, you get there faster. Now you have three minimum payments going to the next debt. And so you start getting this snowball of minimum payments that starts becoming a big chunk of money eradicating the debt. This is a behavioral concept. You know, logically, it doesn't make sense. Logically, you always pay off your highest interest rate debt first. But behaviorally, by going after the smallest do dollar amounts due first, you get the earliest wins, endorphin release, you get momentum, and you're more likely to pay off all your debt than any other way. Uh, yeah, that makes total sense. And I think the, the key part of this that we need to underline is that you got to tear up the statement and say, oh, that feels so good. Like, that's the celebration. Yeah, I, I actually, I have one company, one debtor I had uh, that only sent digital statements. I printed it out, every single one, and just sat there for about a half hour just tearing up and dropping it. It felt so good. And it's the emotional release. It, that is the rewiring of our brains. It was funny. I think it was Susie Orman who I'm not necessarily really a fan of. I just watch her on TV. She's actually a remarkable presenter. I was extremely impressed. And she said, um, the day you get more satisfaction out of savings than you do spending is the day you're rich. And 
the day I started ripping up those statements, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting more joy out of not paying bills than buying stuff. That was the day that I knew wealth in my business and my life was inevitable. And I think yeah, that's what you all point. need to get to. And, and by ripping up statements, that is way more satisfying uh, than buying something new in many cases, to be honest. Uh, amazing. Amazing. So the uh, what uh, we're getting close to time here. I, I want to oh, make yeah. sure that yeah, the taps, the target allocated percentage is something that is doable for our listener so yeah. that they're not trying to over, like, right. like, I don't know, go crazy. And then they miss the mark and then they feel bad they, and then they, they say, up. screw it. Yeah. That's so the where do they come failure. up with a tap? The biggest failure that we have had with the profit first system in our case studies is that a business goes in with a high taps, target allocation percentage, baby steps, start slow. We actually have two terms. We have taps, which is a target. We have caps, which is your current allocation percentages. Yeah. And what we tell businesses is we look at their historical numbers and say you had no profit historically, which by the way is the norm for most businesses. And we're targeting taps of maybe a 20% profit in the future. We're not going to start at 20%. We're going to do it in small increments. We simply next figure out the time frame. Say so we want to get there in two years. Well, that gives us eight quarters, two years. So you take 20% our target from our current spot, which is zero. So that's 20 still, 20%. Divide it by eight. And that's roughly two, two and a half percent. So what I do is the first quarters, I now set it at two and a half percent profit. That's small enough. You start allocating money toward profit. You still, you know, a thousand bucks comes in. I'm saying take 25 bucks. That's two and a half percent. That's negligible. And you got the rest of the money to run your business. Then over time, uh, at the next quarter, now we go up in the next increment, two and a half goes to 5%. Right. And we slowly step our way up into this process. And every time you take a step up, there's a little bit of a growing pain. You've got to cut costs. You've got to increase margin, but then you adjust and then we do it again. And maybe it takes two years to get to your true taps that you were targeting, but you'll get there much better, much more successfully than if you just try abruptly doing it today. It's like if you've never worked out and you go to the gym, and you're like, oh, I'm going to start lifting this huge weight. You're going to rip your shoulders out. Let's start <laughs> slow and let it grow. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Great advice. All of this was fabulous. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Thank you Thanks. so much. So now where do we send our listener to to get your books, to learn more, to, to like up level? their yeah. lives and businesses. I, well, I got Stefan. Thanks for letting me share this. And, and I've got the spot for you. It's Mike motorbike. Now here's the, the thing. It's really Mike McCallowitz.com. I found Stefan. No one can spell McCallowitz. Uh, but Mike motorbike as in a motorcycle, everyone can spell and remember because it rhymes. That was my nickname in high school. So that's what I'm using. So go to Mike motorbike.com. It's my website. You'll find all my books there with free chapter downloads. So you can explore them before you decide to purchase or not. But I also used to write for the Wall Street Journal. So my articles are there. Uh, I'm a podcaster and a blogger. All that content, and it's all free at MikeMotorBike.com. Thank you so much, Mike. This was a ton of fun. Thanks, we'll thank catch you. you. So thank you, guests. Uh, uh, thank you, listeners. We'll catch you on the next episode. We'll, uh, this is your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.